Stuff I like. Stuff I like. <laughs> so <high. laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Somebody's got to write us a tune for stuff I like because I can't stand that anymore. Uh, you know, I, I put off, um, I haven't finished this yet, and I usually like to finish something before I recommend it, but it's so good. I'm actually as close to binge watching as I get, which is like I'm watching one and a half episodes every time I sit down, which I really, I almost never do. I put off recommending it because it's based on a book that was written by my cousin, and our families were very close when I was a kid. Uh, Mind Hunter, which is on Netflix, is based on on the book uh, Mind Hunter by John Douglas and Mark Allshaker. Mark Allshaker is my cousin, and he wrote the book. John Douglas, of course, is the FBI agent who sort of started or mastered the behavioral uh, sciences at um, at the FBI. And his idea was you could profile when they talk about profiling killers and all this. But Mind Hunter. I, it kind of fictionalizes the story, as far as I can tell. It's set in 1977, and it's got these two guys. Uh, Jonathan Groff is the young guy, and uh, Holt McCallany plays the older guy, these two FBI agents who are in this world of old-fashioned, old-time law-busting and start to think, you know, we're starting to see a kind of criminal who operates without motive. And the young guy, his, the uh, the agent is named uh, Holden, what is his name? Holden Ford. The young guy says, you know, we should go talk to these people, talk to these serial killers and find out what makes them tick. And everybody says, why on earth would you talk to these evil people? And the guy says, well, they're in prison. They're not doing anything. So here he is getting ready in this very brief scene. He's getting ready to go talk to one of them. Uh, Cameron Britton plays Edmund Kemper. A, it's a terrific performance as a serial killer. And his partner is basically abrading him for actually doing this. What are you doing? Just in case. Holden, they're not gonna let you in with a sidearm. The guy is six foot nine, weighs 300 pounds. That's right. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna take the thing away from you. He's gonna kill you with it. And then he's gonna have sex with your face. Why are you so tense? No, I'm not tense. What really makes the thing cook is uh, Cameron Britton is wonderful as Edmund Kemper as the as the killer, but uh, Jonathan Groff also plays Holden Ford. There's just something not quite right about him. He's like an he looks like the all American boy and he's kind of an innocent uh, Midwesterner, but there's just something off about him. So you get the feeling there's a connection. And this is the question, and this is why I find I feel this this show is not just so compelling, but it's also kind of profound in a way because it actually speaks directly into the issue that I kind of circling around all the time, which is the way in which we have gone forward in this world uh, following science and leaving religion behind and feeling that those two are somehow at odds instead of that they should be working together. And that um, we have all these wonders, all these terrific wonderful things around us, and yet children, teenagers are killing themselves. I think it's like 70% it's gone up in the last 10, 12 years. And when they study this, they find they have no religion in their life, they have no meaning in their life. And when you read these books about the Enlightenment and about science, they all say, oh, people are unhappy because they want to go back to this primitive way of religious way of thinking. But it never occurs to him, to them that maybe we got one thing right and one thing wrong. What happened in the during the Enlightenment is scientists started to say the human mind is deceivable, right? It, seen, it sees the sun moving, but it's really the earth moving. So the human mind can't be trusted, A. And B, we were misled by attaching value to material. So we were misled by ideas of teleology, that things have a meaning or a purpose. Or for instance, Plato saying the perfect shape is a, is a circle, therefore the orbits of the planets must be in a circle. Plato didn't say that, I don't think, I think it was the Neoplatonists, but the point is that, that the idea that we should have kind of spiritual theories that explain material instead of doing experiments on the material themselves. So they ditched the values, they ditched the religion and went after the science and it worked great. And so now they're saying, well, that religion was a problem, right? Because this is working so great, which is kind of like me. You know, I'm an artist. My wife knew when she married me, she was marrying an artist. Sometimes when I get completely wrapped up in, in something, I become useless, right? I become emotionally unavailable. I'm, my mind is all wrapped up. I become so absent-minded that it's like uh, I'm almost insane. My wife wants to ask me about scheduling. I'm completely not there. And it works, right? It helps me finish the book that I'm working on. And the book comes out and I love the book and it's terrific. And it, I th it would be as if I thought to myself, well, that worked really well. So now I'll never pay attention to my wife. 
In other words, science is a, an exercise. It is one thing that we do. It is one thing that we do, and it requires a cold mind unfettered with theories or, or with spiritual ideas, unfettered by ideas of what sh material should be telling us. It should just be a way of finding out what material does tell us. But that doesn't mean that science is the only thing we do and the only way forward. When you have this world of wonders with our lo longer lifespans and the good health and food and all this stuff, and people are killing themselves, something has gone terribly wrong. We have left something behind. And this is what I think this story is about, because here is this guy who wants to study serial killers, and everybody keeps saying, but they're evil. And he says, yes, but if I get caught up in the evil of them, then I won't be able to study them. If I get caught up in the moral questions, I won't be able to study them. Therefore, the moral questions are not meaningful. And of course, the great story that examines this exact division is Silence of the Lambs. The boss character in Silence of the Lambs is based on, is a fictionalization of John Douglas, the guy that Mark Allshaker was writing the book about, right? And he sends uh, Clarice Starling out to get the insights of Hannibal Lecter the scientist, essentially, they get the insights of Hannibal Lecter in uh, about another serial killer. And Hannibal Lecter, Lecter means reader, and Hannibal, of course, is the great uh, barbarian who almost destroyed Western civilization. Uh, so Hannibal Lecter is, is science. He's like complete science, you know, a completely rational mind, and he's crazy. He's out of his mind. And this is the moment when you can see when, that he's trying to seduce the FBI agent into his world. But you're not more than one generation from poor white trash, are you, Agent Starling? And that accent you've tried so desperately to shed, pure West Virginia. What is your father to you? Is he a coal miner? Does he stink of the land? And oh, how quickly the boys found you. All those tedious, sticky fumblings in the back seats of cars while you could only dream of getting out, getting anywhere, getting all the way to the end. See a lot, Doctor. But are you strong enough to point that high powered perception at yourself? What about it? Why don't you why don't you look at yourself and write down what you see? Maybe you're afraid to. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. The reason that line is so famous and so resonant is because the census taker represents this world of science and he devoured him because once you take the spirit away from people, they just become meat. That's what cannibalism is. That's what zombies are. It's this idea of people as meat. And so even though he, uh, Lecter does deliver the insights that the FBI agent needs, she needs to go back into the world of morality in order to keep from becoming him. And that is what all the Hannibal Lecter books are about. And it really is a fascinating story. And Mindhunter tells it from a more uh, realistic and historical perspective. But it's the same story of how you deal with the, the physical world without losing your spiritual sense of yourself, because that is exactly what has happened to our society and why we've lost the logic of freedom and the West. All right. But, but don't worry, because the Clavenless weekend is here, so we're all doomed. However, <laughs> some of you may survive. If you do, come back here on Monday. I will be here. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show, and we will see you then. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And our animations are by Cynthia Angulo and Jacob Jackson. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire forward publishing production. Copyright forward publishing 2018.